expensive, so buy it carefully. What you're looking for are spears all of the same diameter so they'll cook evenly and look attractive. And what you'd like to be each spear to look like this, tight butt end, fresh firm stalk, no withering down at the butt end. And when you get them home, treat them just like cut flowers. Line them up at the tips here and then cut off just a little bit from the butt ends because they've crusted over and then put them in a container with about an inch of water, cover them loosely with plastic and refrigerate them where they'll keep perfectly for a day or two. Preparing asparagus for cooking takes a little extra work but it's well worth it because you almost double the yield. It's a terrible thing to take an asparagus and just bend it until it breaks. There, you've thrown a third of that away, and it's all edible. All you need to do is just to peel it. You peel it with a little knife or a vegetable peeler. You can eat the whole thing from tip to butt. To cook asparagus, drop the stalks in rapidly boiling water, add a little salt, and come back in four or five minutes to check on them. That should be time enough. Now here's how you tell. Pick it up and you see that dust bends a little tiny bit. They're beautifully green and so out they come. And drain them on a towel. Hot boiled asparagus, so delicious you can eat it all by itself, but well, there's nothing wrong with a little melted butter on it. Or asparagus with hollandaise sauce. Boy, that's good. Or cold asparagus with a little vinaigrette sauce. But however you serve it, it's so dramatic. I like to have it as a separate course. There are very few vegetables that could be considered a meal in itself, but one exception is the artichoke. A beautiful vegetable, when you buy it, you want to make sure it's good and fresh. Feel the leaves, they should feel fleshy, the head should feel heavy, and it should squeak if it's really fresh. And this one is the kind where the leaves go inward, that some of them are more spiky and the leaves go outward, but if it feels fresh, it's fine. And to prepare them for cooking, take a big knife and cut off the stem close to the base, and have a half lemon ready. Rub any cut parts with lemon, because they discolor, and you'll notice they're very sharp points on the ends of the leaves, and you want to get rid of them or you'll prickle yourself and your guests. So cut the top part of the head off and then take your scissors and cut all around, cutting the prickles off each one. Now, I like to steam artichokes. I just think they cook better. There's my big wide pot, and here's one of these little steaming baskets you get at the hardware store. And I also like to cook them upside down, because as you see, that's, you want the steam to penetrate right into the leaves there. And these should steam covered for about 30 minutes. There, that's been just about 30 minutes, and I think they'll be done. And you can tell by having a sharp little knife and just poking right down through the heart. That penetrates easily. Had they been a little older, they might have taken a few minutes longer. Now, if you're an old hand at eating artichokes, you may proceed directly to broccoli and cauliflower, our next section. But if you need a little instruction, here's how to go about it. Take off a leaf here. You notice that whole bottom section there from the inside of the leaf is tender and beautiful. You just put that up, put it in your mouth, and draw it between your teeth, getting off that delicious flesh. And also we have, you can have a little melted butter, you can have a little hollandaise and do the same with that. And then you continue on through. Now after you've cruised through the leaves, you come down to this tender portion. This is known as the heart of the artichoke. And it's almost all edible. You remove it from the bottom. And you can just eat that just as is, chewing all around there. And now we've come to the bottom of the artichoke. And this is covered by a hairy portion of the thistle, which is known as the choke, and that's inedible. So after you've cut it in half, just cut off that choke part, and you have this beautiful portion here to eat. So that's probably all you need to know about eating artichokes from top to bottom. Broccoli 
and cauliflower. They're country cousins, and both are prepared and cooked in much the same way. Now with broccoli, you have a tough stem and you have tender flowers. And the way to cook them is to separate the stem from the flowers, and then they'll both be tender. So there's your stem, and you just have to peel that down, just really cut fairly deeply until you get down to the whitish flesh. You'll end with a small piece like that, and just cut that into nice pieces, and that will be just as tender as the flowers. But you have also a little problem with the flowerets here because you have tough stem there, too, so the thing to do is just to peel the stem, and then everything will be beautiful and tender. This is work, but it's well worth it if you want a beautiful vegetable. Now we come to cauliflower. We have this tough stem in here, but that also can be edible if you just peel it and cut it the same way you did for the broccoli. You see, when you get down there, that's tender, so cut that into nice little pieces, and you can use it. And then again, you have the floweret, but you have toughness in the skin here. Peel that. And if it turns out that the stem, that this very big, cut a little slit in it there so that the water will penetrate. All these little extras make a great deal of difference in having a fine vegetable to eat. Now with the broccoli, I want this to remain absolutely green and beautiful. So I cook it in an uncovered pot of rapidly boiling water. And it's only going to take about three or four minutes because it's been peeled. And you want to stand right over that. I want these vegetables to be exactly right. I just hate them when they're warmed over raw or crunchily underdone, as they say. And I don't want them limp. I think the only thing is to... That's exactly right. It's just done. Look at how beautiful and green it is. And it's just tender. So take them out immediately, and they cook so quickly, you can serve them just as is, or make a little sauce for them. Now the sauce couldn't be simpler. A tablespoon each of, of olive oil and butter, a little bit of garlic. Swish that around. In goes the hot broccoli. Toss it about, a little bit of salt, and it's ready to serve. Now with cauliflower, unlike broccoli, I don't have to preserve any green color. So rather than boiling it, I can steam it. it saves energy because you just need a little bit of water. And it cooks in just about the same amount of time. Cover it. It'll be from three to five minutes. Cauliflower is done just like broccoli when you take your little knife and poke into a stem there. And it's just tender. It should be just exactly done. Not raw and crunchily undercooked, and not mushy. So you've got to watch it. And if you haven't lost this little gadget, out comes the steamer. And you can serve it just as it is with a little butter and salt and pepper, or you can gratiné it. That's very easy to do. It's particularly nice if you want to do something ahead. Here I've got a buttered gratin dish. And I have a little of our old familiar white sauce, or bechamel, and I'm putting a little handful of grated Swiss cheese in that. Stir it all around, and then put just a little bit of a layer in the bottom. And then in goes the cauliflower. I think that can just, I'm just going to sort of dump it all in because it's going to have sauce on top, so no one will ever know whether it's upside down or right side up. And then a little layer of sauce on top. Finally, a little sprinkling of grated cheese on top. Now, the good thing about a gratin is that you can get this all done ahead of time, and then about 20 minutes before you're ready to serve it, get your oven preheated to 425, and stick it in the upper third, and let it cook until it is just heated through and bubbling and lightly browned. Don't overcook it, because that's like old steam table food. Broccoli and cauliflower. To know one is to know the other. When you're looking for a vegetable with lots of personality to stand up against an aggressive meat like wild boar, turkey, pork, or something, consider the Brussels sprout. It's got a wonderful flavor, 
but you want it to be very, very fresh. Here's how they grow on a stem like this. Big ones down at the bottom, little tiny ones up at the top. And what you want is a very, very fresh Brussels sprout. They should smell fresh. Pull off any loose leaves. This is to prepare them for cooking. Shave off the stem end there, and then pierce across in the bottom. That's for quicker cooking. There's a nice big pot of boiling water, and I'm going to dump a little salt in it. And then, like all green vegetables, I'm going to dump them right in and boil them rapidly, uncovered, for four or five minutes. Look at that lovely green color. I think they're done. I'm just going to poke it. And the knife just goes in. This is, as with all these vegetables, be very careful not to overcook them. Just done, not raw, not overcooked. And now you can serve them just as they are with salt and pepper and butter, or you can gratinate them, anything that's good for broccoli and cauliflower is good for Brussels sprouts. But I've got another idea. Now I'm going to run some cold water over them to stop the cooking, and also that sets the green color. That's just cool enough so I can handle. And then I'm going to cut them in half. Now, because these Brussels sprouts have already been pre-cooked, they just need warming through. So I've got a tablespoon and a half of butter in there. In go the sprouts, toss them around, a little salt on them, a little bit of pepper, and just about a minute, and they're all ready to serve. There are the Brussels sprouts, all green and buttery. Now, bring on the wild boar. and cooking green beans is a snap, pun intended, but it really is. Look at these little luxury babies, these Ari Cove airs. Just snap off the two ends, cook it whole. With these larger beans, snap off the two ends, cook it just like that. With a wider bean like this, you have to do a little more work, but it's well worth it. You French them, just cut them on the slant like that. You notice I've got an enormous pot of boiling water, and the reason for that is I want the volume of the water to overwhelm the volume of the beans so that it'll immediately come back to the boil and seal in the vitamins and the nutrients and above all the color. And there goes in a little salt. And that'll only take about two or three minutes. Watch them. There, that's back to the boil. It's just gonna take a few minutes. I don't want them to overcook. Now let's taste one. That's ready. I've got to stop the cooking now. Now here's the best way to do is drain out all this boiling water into the sink. And then dump the beans back into the pot. Put in cold water and if you've got enough of it, ice. The idea here is to set the color and the texture. Now they're thoroughly chilled. I've stabilized them. The cooking has stopped. I can do anything I want with them. They're perfect in color and texture. I can serve them cold in a salad, or I can reheat them just before I want to serve. Now, just about five minutes before I'm going to serve them, I've got a nice big frying pan in there. I'm just pouring them in there nakedly just to dry them off a little bit. Now I'm going to put in a little butter, toss them around. A little bit of salt. Now as a final touch, a little bit of lemon juice. And finally, just a little bit of parsley. That's the, that's the classic finish, and they're ready to serve. There you have it, hot or cold, the lovely, subtle taste of fresh green beans. 
know, the thing about fresh spinach is whether you buy it in a bag like this or whether you buy it loose, it's got to be washed. It's full of sand. So put it in a big basin of water, pump it up and down, and look at all the sand in the bottom of that sink there, and then lift it out. And the reason you lift it out is that you leave the sand behind. Wash it two or three times until you're sure it's clean. The flavor of spinach is in the leaf, not in the stem, so you want to remove the stem. Hold the leaf upside down and hold your hand under, underneath it, and then take your thumb and forefinger and just pull that stem out. There you are. And the, these little touches take time, but they make all the difference between really good cooking and just humdrum cooking. When your recipe calls for cooked chopped spinach, this is the best way of doing it. Same way as with green beans, you have a large pot of rapidly boiling water, salt it, and in goes your spinach. As with all green vegetables, you cook it uncovered at the fast boil, and it only takes two or three minutes, so best to stand right over it. Look. Just a minute or two at the full boil and it's limp, like this. Now you want to drain it immediately. Now you run cold water into it. That's to refresh it, to stop the cooking. Now I'm going to drain it. As you can see, that's remained nice and green. That's just what we want. Now I've got to get the excess water out, so I'm going to squeeze it. And squeeze that good and hard. There. This is a very important step. Now remember, I said chopped spinach, and that should be chopped by hand. about two cups of spinach there and there's a tablespoon and a half of butter and in goes the spinach and I want to cook that very slowly to get rid of any excess water. Notice after about two minutes or so the spinach is almost beginning to stick to the bottom of the pan and at that point you want to add a tablespoon of flour. This makes a liaison or a light thickening. You want to stir that and cook it for about a minute or two to cook the flour. And now put in, I'm going to put in about half a cup of stock, or you could use cream. You want to stir that around and let that bubble. And then this is going to have to cook two or three minutes to cook the spinach and make the liaison. Now there's a little bit of salt. That goes in. We can always add more later. A little bit of pepper and also a little tiny bit of nutmeg. You never want to add too much because that would taste of nutmeg, but that's a very subtle addition. There you are, cooked chopped spinach. It's ready to go into souffles, stuffings, quiches, or anything called Florentine, and it's perfectly delicious just as it is. If you love fresh green peas, you've got a wonderful collection in the market today. You have snow peas. All you need to do to these is to take off that little stem in. Sometimes there's a string. And then just quickly stir fry it. Then you have the edible potted peas, sometimes called sugar snaps. And this has to be strung on each side. And then you can either stir fry that or eat it raw. And then you've got the good old fashioned pea in the pod. And this, of course, you have to open up and shell. I think these are really my favorites, especially when cooked the way my old French chef taught me how to do it. Here's how you do it. I've got about three cups of peas there, so I want about a good tablespoon of butter, and then a little bit of salt. I always add a little more salt afterwards. And then, to give the illusion of fresh peas, about a half teaspoon of sugar, 
and then you take your rubber spatula and you bruise those all together. Or you could take your bare hands if you wanted. Why the bruising, you may well ask. Well, that's the way he did it, and that's why I always do. I suppose it's to make the flavors penetrate. And now, well bruised, put in water just enough almost to cover. Then turn the heat high, put on the cover, and let that boil hard and come back in five minutes. The peas are done when tender. Check them every five minutes. These took 10 to 12 in there just right. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine life without parsnips or butternut squash, carrots, purple top turnips, and rutabagas? They all have a marvelous natural flavor, and you want to retain that when you cook it. Take butternut squash, cut it in half, take out the seeds, peel it, Chunk it and it's ready to cook. This is known as the boil steam method. You put in just enough water to cook the vegetable, then you cover it, cook it over high heat, and by the time the vegetable is cooked, the water is all evaporated and you've not lost any flavor. So here we have the vegetable and you put in about, in this case, about halfway up. Add a little salt, cover the pot, Turn the heat to high, boil it hard, and then come back and look at it every once in a while and add a little more liquid if it's needed. There, after eight or ten minutes, that's tender and tasty. Toss it with a little bit of butter and a little parsley, and that's going to be ready to serve. Now, with rutabaga, it's exactly the same method. Boiled, steamed, just the same way. Now I'm going to flavor it with a little freshly grated ginger. That gives it a very nice flavor. Toss it around, and it's ready to serve. Carrots, cooked exactly the same way, the boil steam method, nicely buttered. A little bit of chopped scallion wouldn't hurt them at all. And there they are, ready to serve. Now these beautiful fresh turnips, Another variation on the finish for the boil steam method after they're tender is to puree them. You can do this with any one of these vegetables. And as a matter of fact, if you want a puree, the boil steam method gives it much the best flavor. Once the turnips have been nicely pureed, set them over high heat and stir them around to evaporate extra moisture. That's really necessary with turnips. And then Flavor them up nicely with butter or cream and a little salt and pepper, and they're ready to serve. Parsnips, everything's the same. Boil them, steam them, and puree them. Next, set your puree in a pan over boiling water, a kind of bain marie, and this is a final finish. You want to beat in, I've got about three cups of puree there, and I'm going to beat in about a third to a half of a cup of cream. Stir that in thoroughly. Well, that's, when that's absorbed, then put in a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. Stir that in. Then cover the pan and let that mellow over simmering water for about 20 minutes, stirring it up once or twice. You'll be amazed at the transformation in taste here. Serve them to people who don't respect the parsnip, and you'll see they'll be right back for more. There you are. Bring on the carrots, the squash, the turnips, the rutabagas, and don't forget those parsnips. Braising. It's one of the best ways to do certain vegetables, like Belgian endive. Here it is, just perfect. Note that the end is tightly closed. And all you need to do to these is just to trim off that root. But be sure that you leave the leaves attached onto the root. Everything is clean. It doesn't even need washing. That's ready to cook, just as is. Celery is wonderful braised also. We just want the celery heart 
So cut it off so it's about seven or in, eight inches long and then pull off the tough outer leaves, save them for soup or salad. And then just again trim the root very carefully because you want to make sure that these stalks stay together. And then you can either cut that in half or in thirds. I think I'll just cut that in half because it's not too thick. There we are. And then wash that under cold running water so it looks nice and clean like this. And that's now ready to braise. Leeks are, are a different matter. Now that's a beautiful vegetable, a member of the onion family with its own special perfume. Cut it off seven or eight inches long. And then again, trim the root, being sure that you leave the leaves attached. And then you have a real problem of, that's not a problem at all, but you really have to get all the dirt out from between the leaves. So see just where the green begins, slit one way and turn it and slit the other. And then you want to open it up and wash it very carefully under the cold water faucet. There's nothing worse than a gritty leak. Now here they are in my flame-proof dish. This is a butter dish. I put them in cut side down. Now I'm going to put on, cover them about, oh, a third of the way up, just with plain water. Then on goes on a little bit of salt, and also some few little pieces of butter. That gives them a very nice flavor. And then a buttered piece of wax paper on top. And because I have a flame-proof dish here, I'm cooking them on top of the stove, which you could perfectly well cook them in a 350 oven. Then you want a cover of some sort, like an old jelly roll pan. And that is to simmer very slowly. And I'm going to come back in exactly 12 minutes. Well, I'm just going to see how these are. They were very fresh. That's just about it. I think I'm going to give them just about two minutes more. That won't hurt them any. Now I've removed these leeks, which are beautifully tender and nicely green still. Here are the juices they cooked, and I've boiled those down. And now I'm just going to swish in a little bit of butter. Could, of course, eat this without butter. And now I'll just spoon those nice juices over the leeks, and that makes a beautiful dish. And now for the braised celery. I cooked this in a 350 oven because I had a glass dish, so I couldn't cook it on the stove. And it's been in there half an hour. And it's just essentially the same, but there's a little difference in that I've covered it with a brunoise of vegetables. That's finely chopped carrots, celery, and onions. And rather than water, I have chicken stock in there. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. And then I can make the juices into a sauce by boiling them down and buttering them, as I did for the leeks. Or it can be turned into a cheese sauce using the same principles as we did for the cauliflower. Now here's this endive. It starts out a little differently. I've got it half covered with boiling water. Now I'm going to put in a tablespoon of butter and a little bit of salt and then the juice of half a lemon. The lemon is really necessary with the endive because sometimes it's a little bitter. And then cover it with wax paper that's buttered and put a cover on and let that boil hard for about 15 minutes until it's almost tender. Now after 15 to 20 minutes, check that and it should be almost tender there, which that is. Then cover it again and turn the heat way, way, way down. I just should cook it a very, very slow simmer for really one and a half to two hours until it is golden throughout. And here are our braised on the lightly browned and golden throughout after their long cooking. A distinguished member of this family of classic braised vegetables. I can't think of any other vegetable as universally eaten as cabbage. All over the world, cabbage is king, and with good reason, because it's inexpensive, easy to cook, and it's delicious. 
I'm going to start with a hard-headed green cabbage. Just cut it in half with your big knife. Then cut the half in half. And then just shred it. I call this six-minute cabbage. I've got about four cups in here, and I'm going to put in about half a cup of liquid. That's a little chicken stock. It could be water. A little bit of salt, not too much. And there's a nice touch, a little caraway seed. That's about a quarter of a teaspoon in there. And just toss that up and around. Put the cover on. Let it boil hard for about six minutes. There, that's quick. The liquid is practically all evaporated. The cabbage is tender. You can eat it just like that. But if you're not too fat, put in a little bit of cream, about a quarter of a cup of it. Let that boil and thicken lightly. Color it up with a little parsley, and that's done. That was quick. Red cabbage is almost the same as green cabbage, but it's different. It's a little tougher, and you've got to get more flavor in it. So in this pot, I have half of a sliced red onion that's been sautéed in a little bit of oil, and I have a grated sour apple, and the sourness is to help keep the color of the cabbage. And also I'm going to put in, for more sourness, I'm going to put in about two tablespoons of red wine vinegar, and then, again for flavor, a large clove of pureed garlic, and a bay leaf, and a little bit of caraway seed. That's about half a, ta half a teaspoon of caraway seed. And we have to have a little bit of sugar in there. That's about half a teaspoon. And about another, about half a teaspoon of salt. We can always add more later. And some pepper. And half a cup of water. And then here are my four cups of red cabbage. And stir that all around. Now that's been cooking about 10 minutes in all. And I've tossed it up every now and then. And now that's tender. Now you want to taste it very, very carefully for seasoning. That reminds me. When you're cooking, don't add everything at once that it calls for in the recipe. Just do it a little bit gradually. I think that needs a little more salt. And I find a lack of pepper. I'm put some of that in. You may want a little more vinegar. You might want a little more sugar. But just taste it very carefully. And then just before it's done, add what's necessary. And that now is done and ready to serve. Now, red cabbage, that goes wonderfully with robust meats like goose and pork and sausages. And green cabbage, well, that goes with just about anything. When your recipe calls for small braised onions, here's how to do it. These are whole onions. The first thing you have to do is to peel them. And the easiest way to do is to dump them into rapidly boiling water and boil them for exactly one minute. These are not being cooked. This is just to loosen the skin. There, that's a minute. You know, the same techniques works perfectly for peeling tomatoes and even peaches. They run a little bit of cold water on them just to cool them off so you can handle them. And you'll see how easily that skin slips off. Just shave off the root end and there's your skin coming off. And shave off a little bit from the other end. And then pierce across in the root end so that the cooking water will penetrate quickly. Now when your recipe calls for brown braised onions, take your little peeled onions and saute them in oil, shaking the pan until they begin to brown. They're not going to brown all over, as you see. There's going to be kind of a patchy brown. And notice that they're all in one layer. They've all got to touch the bottom of the pan. There, I'm going to consider that's enough. So in goes a little chicken stock, or whatever your recipe calls for. Turn the heat down. Cover the pan. And these are to cook very, very slowly until they're tender. That's probably 25 minutes. Well, I checked these at 25 minutes. They weren't quite done. It's been over half an hour. Now, they are tender when pierced with a f 
knife, but they've got to remain intact. When your recipe calls for little boiled onions, don't boil them. Braise them in a little bit of liquid. That way you'll keep the white color and you'll get the best flavor. Here, just a little bit of liquid that's about halfway up, a little bit of salt, a little bit of butter. Cover them, simmer them very slowly until tender, just as for the brown braised onions. There's our white braised onions. Those are tender, and the liquid is almost evaporated. Now, supposing you want to serve some creamed onions for your Thanksgiving turkey, just get some really heavy whipping cream, still a little bit of liquid there in the onions, and boil that down, and it'll thicken all by itself. And that makes a delicious creamed onion. Baste them every once in a while as it boils. There, see how thick that is? Those are ready to serve. Little braised onions, good in stews, good around a roast, and so good all by themselves. When you're just dying for some good cooked vegetables for dinner but just have practically no time, consider grating them. They cook in minutes. The zucchini does beautifully. Winter squash, turnips, carrots, rudy beggars, and beets. Beets are marvelous done this way. They take so long in the ordinary way, but just grate them. <laughs> Grated beets are done in a steam cook way. I've got two tablespoons of butter in my pan here and about three cups of grated beets. And the, you first want to just toss them around to coat them a little bit with that butter. And then add just enough water so that they'll steam. That's about, I'll say, a quarter of an inch, if that much, in there. A little bit of salt. And then, because you want to keep the red color of the beets, put in about a half or well, maybe a teaspoon of wine vinegar. You can always add a little bit more later if you need it. Cover it, and then come back and check it every five minutes. Now I'm just checking in there. You do want that every once in a while, see if there's enough liquid and how the color is going, and then just continue cooking until they're tender. Now that's only been about 10 minutes. Those are tender. I'm gonna put in a bit of butter there just to Sweeten them up. And I want to make sure that they're just properly seasoned. I'll just take a little taste there. Those are good. I'm going to take a little tiny bit of salt. But those are now all ready to serve. Now with these tender summer squashes, the grating is the same, but the cooking is a little different. Here I've got zucchini grated skin and all, but zucchini is a very watery vegetable, and you've got to get that out. So what I've done, I've tossed that with a little bit of salt, and the salt draws out the moisture, and look at all the water that's down there. But there's still a lot of water in it. So you pick it up and squeeze it with your bare hands. Look how much more comes out. Now, to cook this grated zucchini, I've got a nice pan with a little butter in there, and there's a little handful of chopped shallots or scallions, and then in goes your grated zucchini. See, if you hadn't squeezed it out, it would take a long time to cook. It would get all mushy before it was done. And this will only take about a minute or two. Just toss it around. And by the time it's warmed through, it's practically all cooked. It's really a miraculous way of doing it. Now well, that's done. So next time you're in the mood for fast food, Try cooking grated vegetables. When you buy eggplant, look for specimens that are firm and shiny and tight-skinned. If they're dull and withered, they're over the hill. Don't buy them. The easiest way to cook them, I think, is just to steam them whole. Put them in a pot on a steamer, close the lid, come back in 10 minutes and look at them. Now eggplant is done when it's really tender, when you poke a knife down through it, and that's really tender. 
So that is ready for a very simple and delicious procedure. Just cut that in half lengthwise, open it up. Look at that nice tender flesh there, and you want to cut down into it. And this is so that it can receive the seasonings. And then I want to, I'm going to put it onto its serving platter. And now I'm going to have some garlic flavoring sauce. This is a nice way to do garlic. There's a whole clove and you go wham. As you see, the peel comes right off. There's a little bit on the end I'm going to discard. And then start chopping it up a little bit. Then put on a little salt. And the reason for the salt is that it softens the garlic so that you can really mash it. It takes a little bit longer than the garlic press, but you don't have to wash it out. That's one trouble with the press. Now that's mashed enough, I would think. Now I'm going to mash it with a little bit of olive oil, and then that's going to go over my eggplant. There we are. This is for real garlic lovers. It's kind of a Middle Eastern way of doing things. Then we have lemon juice squeezed in a towel to keep the seeds out. I always have to have lemon juice with eggplant. And now, just a little bit of parsley, and that's all there is going to be to it. Nice thing about this, it's delicious, either hot or cold. Dribble off. Here's another good idea for eggplant, is to bake it in slices. These are about half an inch thick. And because eggplant has a lot of water in it and sometimes a little bitterness, salt it lightly first on each side. Let it sit on paper towels for 20 minutes. And look at how much water comes out. You want to dry it on each side before you do anything with it. Then put it on an oil. This is an oil pan. Arrange it on an oil pizza pan or whatever you've got particularly a good way when you're going to have an eggplant casserole like parmigiano or ratatouille. If you saute it, eggplant acts like a sponge and you get all the oil embedded in it and it's very disagreeable. In this way, you're using just a little bit. Just paint the tops with oil. Now that's painted with oil. And now a little sprinkling of herbs. I'm using that mixture Italian seasoning. Now cover it with aluminum foil and then set it in a 400 degree oven. The reason for the aluminum foil here is so that it will steam while it bakes. That'll take about 20 minutes. There's a, check these several times and they are done. It's been a little over 20 minutes. You see they're nice and tender. You have to be careful to, that they're gonna hold their shape though. Now these are ready to, be, to go into a casserole or you can turn them into an eggplant pizza. First, I'm gonna cover them with a lovely, fresh, homemade tomato puree. That's really more of a sauce than a puree, but it's very nice because it's so fresh. Now a little grated Swiss cheese on each. There's the last of the cheese. Now, just a few little drops of oil over each. Good thing about this recipe is you can get it all done to here and then stick it under the broiler to brown just before serving. There you are. In just a few minutes, the cheese has melted, the eggplant is all heated through, and you got yourself some eggplant pizza. I'm not going to have any trouble giving these away. You certainly can't buy a fresh tomato sauce, so if you want one, you've got to make it. And this happens to be out of season, and so I've got to use winter tomatoes. And they look nice when they've been peeled, seeded, used, and chopped, but they don't have much taste. So I'm going to hype them up with some strained, canned Italian plum tomatoes. They were picked at the height of the season, so with the combination of the two, I'm going to have me a really good sauce. In this nice heavy pot, I have half a cup of minced onions that have been cooked 
in two tablespoons of olive oil and we're quite tender. I'm going to put in my two cups of fresh tomato pulp. And then I'm just going to put in about half of that canned Italian tomato and I can add some more afterwards. There goes a little salt and there's a dried orange peel, that's just for Mediterranean flavor. There's a bay leaf and here's a garlic Oh, puree. And I'm just going to let that cook for a few minutes. What I want it to do is for the pulp to exude its juices and then to thicken up. You know, I've been standing over this sauce. I think I'll give it a little taste now and see how it is. Coming along, I think it could use a little time. I'll put in about, just about a quarter of a teaspoon and I'm also those tomatoes really need a little strength. I'm gonna put a little a little more of that canned Italian. I'm just gonna let that cook slowly for about ten minutes and I'll taste it every now and then. And that's really all there is to it. It's a very free form sauce. Here's a very good fresh tomato sauce that's perfect on pastas, pizzas and parmigianos. Tomatoes Provençal. These are tomato halves that are stuffed with herbal crumbs, and they're absolutely delicious with steaks, chops, roasts, fish, and even scrambled eggs. You start with a raw tomato half that hasn't been peeled, but you've just scooped out the seeds with your little finger, then put a little bit of salt on, on them, and then here's your crumb mixture, which is fresh white crumbs, and be sure they're fresh and soft and nice. Parsley, a little bit of garlic that's pureed, some chopped scallions or shallots, pepper, salt, and then you stuff them just like that. Now I've drizzled them with a little bit of oil and I'm going to put them in the upper third of a preheated 400 degree oven. They should brown lightly on top and just cook through but hold their shape. It'll take about 20 minutes. There, those are done and they're nicely, lightly browned on top, hot through, but they hold their shape. Plain boiled rice is very nice when you have a stew and something to sop up the sauce with, but when you want some rice with personality, you want braised rice. That means you've added some flavor to it, and this, as it so often happens in this business, we have about three tablespoons of minced onion cooking and two tablespoons of butter and here I have one cup of long grain rice and for this dish braised rice you want to be sure that it's long grain and then you stir it around and as it absorbs the butter it becomes translucent and then you want to cook it for two or three minutes stirring until the grains turn milky See, they're beginning to turn. They haven't all turned. And the reason for this sautéing is to cook the outer coating on the rice grains, and then they won't stick together when they start simmering in liquid. Now, I would say that was milky enough, so I'm going to put in a little liquid. I always like to have a little dry white wine or vermouth. That's just about two or three tablespoons full. And then... The rules are, for every one cup of rice, you have two cups of liquid. So I have two cups of very nice homemade chicken stock there. And I'm going to put in a bay leaf. Then you want to bring that up to the simmer and then just cover it. So I'll wait till it comes to the simmer. Now that's just come up to the simmer. You can stir it until it comes to the simmer, but after that, don't touch it again cover it and let it simmer very slowly and come back in 12 minutes. There, 12 minutes. Look at, see those little holes that go down? That shows it's almost done. I'm tipping it and there's still a little liquid so I'm going to cover it again. You'd never stir it at this point until everything is evaporated because you can make the grains gummy. That is done. Take out the bay leaf, and now, finally, you can't stir it, but always with a fork. And have a nice taste and see what you think. Good, good, good. I don't really, I'll put a little pepper in. 
And if you want, you can stir in a little butter. I think it's just about right the way it is. There you are, rice with personality. What's your favorite way of doing potatoes? Could it be potato salad with onions and peppers and mayonnaise and hard-boiled eggs? Or creamy mashed potatoes all stirred up with butter? Or just a plain parsley boiled potato? How about homemade french fries done in perfect oil? What's breakfast without hash brown and fried eggs? A meal in itself, scallop potatoes bubbling in a cheese sauce. And invite me over if you're going to have baked potatoes topped with sour cream and chives. Do you know, they say that there are over 300 recipes for potatoes alone. That just seems incredible. It shows how popular a dish it is. I want to give you two of mine. And one of my all-time favorites is raw potato sautéed in butter with a little chives and parsley. I think that's a marvelous dish. But you have to be sure to get the right potato. You want either new potatoes or these red-skinned ones that are also good for boiling. And if you do them the head, the way I've done here, keep them in cold water so they won't discolor. Here are my potatoes, all drained and thoroughly dried, which is very important when you're doing sautéed raw potatoes. And I've got my crusty no-stick pan. There's a tablespoon of butter and about a teaspoon of oil, so that's well fortified. That's nicely bubbling. In go the potatoes. I don't want too many. You shake them around for just a moment and then let them begin to crust on the bottom. Now the pan you use is very important. You don't want the potatoes to stick to it or you'll have a mess. And if you want to shake it like this, get the professional shape with sloping sides and a long handle. And for shaking, you're jerking it towards you. You're not tossing it. Jerk, jerk, and they all turn over. Now these are potatoes are lightly brown, but they're not done. So I'm going to put in a little bit of salt. And then if you like a, a herb of some type, I'm going to put in a little tarragon, just because I love tarragon. Shake that around. And then to hurry up the cooking, I'm going to cover it for a few minutes and that'll steam them. Ooh, those, I think those are done. Only way to tell is to eat one, rather large one. Yep, done, yep, done, very good. Now I'm gonna put in a little fresh butter there, a little bit of shallots. You don't have to do that, but it's nice. Toss those around a bit. Toss in a little parsley, and those are ready to serve. <laughs> These machines do such a wonderful job on potatoes. Look at that beautiful thin slice there. That's just what I want for my gratin. I've got a buttered baking dish here, and I'm squishing some garlic into it, and then squishing that all around on this heavily buttered dish. And then in go my potatoes. Now I've got to put a little liquid into these potatoes. Seasoned milk. There's a bit of salt. And there's a bit of pepper. And then I've got a metal dish here, so I'm going to put that right over the heat and just put in about, I need about a half an inch of milk there. I mean, the potato's half covered. And then I'm going to put on a little bit, little bits of butter. And as soon as that gets, comes to the simmer, it's going into a preheated oven. There, that's well heated. It's even boiling. I'm going to put that in the upper third of a preheated 425 degree oven. And you'll notice it's in the upper third because that's where it browns. The heat of the oven comes up and falls down, plop, and browns it. There, that'll be 12 to 15 minutes. Here are two of my favorite potato recipes. We've now only 298 to go. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video book on vegetables, and I hope you'll enjoy the rest of this six-part series we call The Way to Cook. This is Julia Child. Bon appétit.